Welcome to the Moms Making Six Figures podcast, where it's all about real women, real stories, real inspiration. And now your host and creator of Moms Making Six Figures, Heidi Bartolotta. I think you should leave that in there. <laughs> Thank you for spending some time with me today. Not like you really had any choice at all in the matter. <laughs> oh, I love it. Thank you for having me. So Kel is one of my dear, dear friends. Let's start out by talking about your professional background. For those that are listening, tell us a little bit about your very diverse and intense at times uh, background. Yeah, I have a really kind of eclectic background. I started off in retail. I was in college and I was a poor college kid. I wanted money. And I realized really quickly on, wait a second, I'm actually good at this work thing. In high school, I don't know that I ever felt like I did anything that I really excelled in. I was kind of okay at everything, but something about working was just fun and it was invigorating and it It challenged me differently than anything else did. And that led me to lots of different opportunities, lots of different careers. And it was because I think I just said yes. Oftentimes I said yes when I wasn't ready for the role, when I had no idea what I was even saying yes to, which meant I worked in almost every aspect of a corporation, right? I made that bridge from retail, jumped out of retail, working 100 hours was just terrible. And then I realized, okay, wait, If I make that bridge, if I somehow get out of this retail world, there's a lot of opportunities. And saying yes opened the doors for so many different projects and opportunities and some failures that went along with it too. What was your favorite piece? You've you've held so many different positions. Which which one, or maybe a couple, did you like the most? I don't know that there was one that I didn't like, luckily. Finance was probably the biggest stretch for me. I liked anything that I got to interact with people, right? Anytime I was able to mentor, coach, um, spend time, help somebody see that they were capable of something more, it fueled me. It fueled me early on in my career when I don't know that I was probably the right person to be mentoring. There was a lot of people who'd been much more seasoned in their careers and it took me a bit to be comfortable in that role because I was very young. Um, But anytime I had the opportunity to work with a team, it was fueling. Anytime I ended up having to be too much of an individual contributor, it didn't work as well. So you transitioned from a very strong corporate environment to a very entrepreneurial role. Will you talk about what made you do that? What was it that drove you to really almost start over again in your career? It was completely starting over. Because entrepreneurial world was not something I ever even aspired for. It was not something that I ever thought, one day I want to own my own business. Um, But life life gives you different things that make you look at the same window with a different lens. And I had kids. Kids showed up. (laughs) (laughs) And it chokes me up still thinking about it because... My son was about three years old and I had plenty of signs that kept directing me. You need to find something else. You need a better balance isn't the right word, but you need to be able to be more present for your children. And I was getting ready for work one morning, just like every other day. And I was rushing out the door and the nanny walked in the door and my son looked at the nanny and said, hi mom. If you need a sign, <laughs> that was it, right? That was the sign. It was, it, and it still took me a while. It still took me a, probably another year to make the transition because when you're in a corporate environment, you kind of know your path. There's not a lot of op- opportunities and just random, you're gonna shift gears. You have to have it a little bit more structured. And so for me to leap into something entrepreneurial meant I had to come up with something on my own. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know what that was going to look like. And it took some time to find it. Yeah, and a lot of self-doubt, I would imagine, comes into that, right? Especially what you had been so successful in that corporate role to do something so incredibly different. There's 
I, was there a question in that for you, whether or not you could biggest, do it? Yeah, not so much that I could do it. And I don't know if that was just being naive, right? I think I often took the naive path. Just say yes and figure it out was kind of a mantra I often went with. Um, but the self-doubt was more, could I find something that I was good enough to do on my own, that I didn't have a team of people around me necessarily, or what was that specialty, or what was gonna stand me apart if I went and left that corporate, mm -hmm. almost um, net safety net, right? There was a safety net that came along with it. The company had the specialty and I just provided a service, mm -hmm. where this meant I had to find something different that was gonna set me apart. And that's probably the trigger for me that was the hardest to, to make that leap. So let's talk about children. Yeah. You. You mentioned, you know, this, I always say elusive balance because again, it's so different depending on who you are and what you do and your children and their needs and who they are, right? So tell us a little bit about how that, how that works for you. What is that, you know, balance? Or I always say rhythm because I think that rhythm I, provides I, a better, you know, visual dynamic, I guess. Yeah, I've, I, I gave up on balance because balance for me is also seasonal, mm -hmm. right? There are certain seasons where my kids get a lot more of my time. They get a lot more of my energy. And then there's other seasons where I look at them and I'll have to say to them, this is my go time. This is time where I'm going to need you to, to love me in my chaos, love me in my busy season, and maybe even nudge me along when I need you to do that. And it's interesting that older the kids get, the more that they understand those seasons. And they also know that's going to be a time where mom's going to give us way too much attention and we're going to want her to be working more. <laughs> um, so it's, it's something that I've realized for me is very seasonal. And part of that is my job. And then part of it is because I can run really hard for a, a period of time, but then I also need the mental break. Mm -hmm. And so it ends up being a, a perfect balance for me and mm -hmm. for my family. And tends to work out with kids schooling and things like that too. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I ask all of my guests is, do you remember when you hit six figures and what did that feel like for yeah. you? I know you always ask this and I have been struggling to remember and I don't. I don't remember when I hit it. And I don't know that it wasn't because I wasn't financially driven. I absolutely was. Uh, again, coming up in, in a situation where I never really felt like I was successful. The dollars was an indicator of you're having success. And it's interesting, the number that I do remember is when I hit 42,000. Random number, mm -hmm. but it was the transition from being in an hourly position to a salaried position. Mm -hmm. And it was a $42,000 and I was young. And so hitting that mark and hitting that first milestone for me was much more impactful because what it meant was I could do this. Mm -hmm. I could do this. And I don't know where the sky is. I don't know where that limit's going to be for me. It just meant that I could do it. And so for me, it was that $42,000 mark. I have no idea when I hit six figures the first time and what that, I don't think it mattered at that point because I think I already knew I could do it. So talk about your journey and the, we all have them, the struggles, the, the things that you had to overcome. You, you held, as you said, many different roles. So the challenges that were there. What are some life lessons that you learned in that? Oh, there's so many. I think the biggest lesson that I learned is that it's okay to fail, right? It was okay to say yes and say yes to something bigger than I was ready for, but it also meant that there was going to be lessons that came along with that <laughs> and challenges and uh, even failure, like big failures, to the point where I remember taking a particular role and I was so in over my head. And it created a lot of frustration because when you go from being an A player who's constantly winning to being in a role where you're sinking and you, I was also in a particular company where collaboration only existed on a very minimal level. You were expected to be an A game player all the time, which meant asking for help was not necessarily something you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And that very well could have been a misconception on my part, but it's how I felt. So I felt like I couldn't just own the fact that I said yes to a role I wasn't capable of. And I remember one day walking in and my boss looking me square in the eyes and he goes, you're playing victim. And I sunk back. I had never been called that before. I had never allowed myself to play in that role. 
And I don't even know I knew exactly what he meant at the time. I remember kind of sitting there. I think I looked like a deer in the headlights. And he goes, it's exactly what you're doing right now. And it was because I kept trying to find reasons why I wasn't successful. Why was I not able to handle this role? And he looked at me and he goes, you can just own the fact that you don't know what the heck you're doing. <laughs> I was like, OK, well, um, the cat's out of the bag. I, I, I don't. I don't know how to manage this. And he goes, OK, finally, you're going to admit it. And there was such a sense of um, disappointment coupled with almost relief. Yeah. Relief, like, mm -hmm. OK, yeah, you're right. And it wasn't the end of the world. And I didn't die. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody got hurt. It just meant that I had to own the fact that I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily in the right role at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. I probably could do that same role right now with my eyes closed, but at that time in my career, I couldn't. And I think it taught me a lot of things, that even if you end up in a, sec in, a, in, a, in a project or in a role or in a position where you're just not feeling it, it's okay to own it because mm -hmm. no one's going to die. And you're going to grow through it, and you're going to learn from it. And I transitioned into another role that was fantastic. I didn't lose my job. I think had I hung on and kept kind of fighting it, it probably would have been a bigger issue down the road. So I think you know when I look at that and I look at moving into entrepreneurial world and the successes and the failures, they're not really failures. They're just realignments. Oftentimes, their realignments, refocuses. Sometimes those failures are because our vision and our focus is on the wrong thing. And as soon as we pivot and make that change, everything realigns and you move forward so much stronger. Mm -hmm. So two things. I obviously know you very well. And one of the things that I think would be very interesting for our listeners to hear is you mentioned a, someone that was a very, very good boss. And you have also had, let's just say, extremely challenging bosses, um, one in particular that I know of. And what, was, what do you think is the difference for those that maybe are managing people or are leading people? What do you see as the difference between those bosses that really helped you to perform in Excel versus the one that really didn't, right? I think there's two things. I think one is the fact that the bosses that really fueled me to grow allowed me to be me, not many versions of them, right? We all operate, we all bring different things to the table. And the ones that looked at me and said, you're really good at this, so I'm going to put you in roles that are going to excel that and to allow you to showcase that versus bosses that said, I need you to be a mini version of me. This is how I do it. You need to do it this way too. And that's stifling. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, and the more that I would try to conform to that type of behavior or that type of thinking, the more I continued to, to fall, right? Mm -hmm. The more that I continued to not excel in the way that they wanted me to. So I think that is a big piece of it. I would say the other piece is the fact that they were real with me. And they didn't hide their flaws or their insecurities or their opportunities for growth. They were just very real in who they were and mm -hmm. their strengths and how they were going to you know, bring those to the table in areas where maybe they weren't so strong, so they leveraged other people in the organization. And having that authenticity with your boss allows you to build a form of trust. And the more trust you have, the more you're willing to work hard for them, the more you know they're going to have your back, the more you're willing to share if something's going wrong, mm -hmm. right? The more that that trust is broken, you tend to try to hide those things. And that's not successful for anyone. Mm -hmm. So you're an amazing coach, and I know this firsthand. And I would say some of those things that you just mentioned are things that you have employed. Tell me, for you, I know that you do a lot of work on personal development and um, the mind and the brain and how we function. We have a lot of listeners that are aspiring to six figures. And then we have others that are maybe at six figures and looking for a community or just wanting to hear that piece of wisdom that you have. Share a little bit about your biggest takeaways in the mindset work that you have done as a coach and mentor to other women. Yeah, there's so much. But I think the biggest thing and the lesson I've learned is that our brain is there to protect us. 
It's to keep us safe. It's not there to give us the best life we want. It's not there to, to create a thriving person and version of you. It's literally there to keep you alive, which means anything that's uncomfortable, anything that's going to challenge you, anything that's going to create emotion in your body, it's not going to want anything to do with. And so our brain will often take away joy. It's going to take away opportunity. It can stifle you. And if you have anybody in your life who gives your brain even the slightest bit of that information that this could go bad, it's going to try to shut it down. And so the more that you can learn to understand who is really talking here, mm -hmm. is it the brain telling you, hold on, wait a second, don't touch that oven, it's hot, or is it your heart, your soul, the, the parts that's going to really fuel you and give you the energy to have the life that you want? And taking the moment to really, when something's triggering, when something's happening, pause and ask yourself, who's really in control here? Is it me or is it my brain? Mm -hmm. And if it's the brain, then you have to really just go, thank you for trying to protect me. That was really cool. <laughs> I know you've got my back, but now you're good. We've already had this conversation. I'm going the direction that my heart needs to go. Mm -hmm. A really dear friend of mine says that um, <laughs> practicing the moment of pause, Practice, and that goes through my head a lot. Practicing the moment of pause, right? <laughs> yeah. So podcast, book, you have lists and lists of them, but give me one or two that you think could be very impactful. Which ones do you recommend the most? The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. I think that's how his name's pronounced, sorry. Um, he's amazing. So habits are everything, right? Because our brain really can control us. So if our brain's going to have that much of an impact in what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, understanding the habits that are fueling us and moving us the direction we need to go versus the habits that derail us away from that bigger purpose is so powerful. And I love his book because he helps you to pause, to look at those behaviors. Some things like as simple as getting up and brushing your teeth is so programmed in our brain we don't think about it. Mm -hmm. We just do it, right? We've been doing it for so long. You don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to go brush my teeth. You just do it. Yeah. But there's so many behaviors in our life, so many habits that we've created in that same unconscious space that are oftentimes the things that are hurting us the most. And so I love his book because he really helps you to break those down. So that's one of my favorites. Brene Brown is amazing. Any of her books are fantastic. She's got a new one out called Dare to Lead. And in a business setting, it's hard to be vulnerable. It's hard to even understand what vulnerable means in a business world. And how can you be raw and authentic yet be professional? And she does a great job of really helping you understand what that looks like and how powerful it is in every aspect of business, whether you're in an entrepreneurial world or you're in a large corporation or anywhere in between, she just really helps dissect what that really means and how to build those characteristics that help you lead authentically. So those are my two favorites at the moment, still. What am I not asking you? What do you, what do you think that our listeners would take something from? You know, I think it's interesting. We're in such a beautiful place in the world and we can get caught in all of the noise and we can hear all of the negative. But I can tell you what, there's so much power in the fact that if you shut down the noise and you actually start having real conversations with people, you're gonna find that there's a lot more good than there really is bad. And so use this opportunity, use the fact that we're in a transition year in our country, in our world, to pull back and look for the good, look for the positive, find ways to have an impact on, our, on your community, on your job, on your family, and do your best to shut the noise down of anything that's going to drive that away for you. Thank you. Thank you for spending time with me. Thanks for being here. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Moms Making Six Figures podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment and leave a review on iTunes. To learn more about Moms Making Six Figures, head over to momsmakingsixfigures.com. That's right, momsmakingsixfigures.com.